Let's pray uh, that the Lord will bless uh, His Word to our hearts. Can we do that? Amen. Father, we come into Your presence. And God, we are so elated for the opportunity to join in fellowship with You. To find ourselves in the presence of the Almighty God. And we thank You, Lord, as we contemplate this Palm Sunday and the joyous celebration of the coming of the King, of the coming of the Savior. And Father, we thank You as we look forward to the end of this week and consider the cross of Jesus Christ. Amen. And I pray, Lord, that in the light of this great and glorious plan of redemption, that God, our hearts, would be made glad and with thankfulness of heart that we will remember again the great price of our Savior to purchase such a salvation. <coughs> In Jesus' name, amen. amen. If you have your Bibles, in fact, if, uh, if you're uncertain of where Ephesians is, please turn to page 1037 in your Bible there. I'm just going to move this before I trip on it. How many of you like to go on a trip? <laughs> I like to go on trips, but not that kind. I'm going to read for you beginning here at verse 3 of Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. Just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame, and before Him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will, and to the praise of the glory of His grace, by which He made us accepted in the Beloved. And in Him, that is Christ. We have redemption through His blood. The forgiveness of sins. According to the riches of God's grace. Now for now I want to tell you. There are certain passages in the scripture. That you and I ought to underline. And take notice of. But I want to tell you. This is one of the most powerful passages of truth. And reason for rejoicing than you and I can ever imagine. Amen. This thought begins that our God, our Father, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, shows you from the foundation of the world to be in Christ. You see, God devised the plan for our redemption. And it was predicated upon one thing. His election. He elected you. He chose you. You know what that word means? Here's what that word election means. That before the foundation of the world, God by way of nothing but His sovereign will, even before you existed, and apart from any merit of your own, chose you to be in Christ. He looked through the annals of time and He saw you and He loved you and He chose you to be in Christ. And He predestined us, verse 5 says, to adoption even as sons by Jesus Christ to Himself according to His good pleasure and His will. You see, God's arm wasn't twisted. He was not compelled by another to desire to adopt you to be his son and his daughter. But rather, the scripture says that he predestined you. He chose to adopt you. 
And He chose to predestine you to be adopted into His family. That word predestined has the idea of setting bounds and limits. And of doing so beforehand. And what that means is that God is actively working through the events of this world and through the circumstances and details of your life to bring you to that place that He has chosen and has desired you to come to. To that place of sonship. And all of your life, behind the scenes, many of which you can't see, God is actively working to bring about His purpose, to bring to you, to bring you to that place where you will receive Christ as your Savior. Amen. He's actively working in your life. The first element in the plan of God was that He chose you. And the second, that He desired to adopt you into His family. And He is working to bring that to pass. And the third element in God's plan is that in Christ you should obtain an inheritance. How many of you like that kind of idea? How many of you like Amen. inheritance? Amen. Amen. Don't you wish, don't you just wish that you were in line for an inheritance from a very rich folk? Well, I want to tell you, God's a whole lot richer Amen. than anyone you know. And He calls you to a rich and eternal inheritance. Verse 11 says that in Christ that you should obtain an inheritance. Not the hope of an inheritance, but to obtain it. And it is His eternal plan. It's a part of His benevolent plan and counsel of His will for you that you might inherit all things. Now friend, I want to tell you that's a pretty deep, pretty deep explanation of what God thinks and plans for your life. What a wondrous plan that God has made. God devised this eternal plan for His church, for each of us. That we should, by way of Christ, come to that elective purpose, that redemptive plan, and that ultimate inheritance. How did God bring this plan to pass? What method would He use to bring those elect people into that relationship and inheritance. It is found in my text today, here in verse 7, for in Christ we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. You see, in order for God to adopt us and bring His elect people into a place of relationship with Him and an inheritance through Christ. God had to redeem them through the blood of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sin according to nothing short of the richness of His grace. Amen. God de determined that He would make a way that in the fullness of time He might gather together all in one, all things in Christ. Now that word redeem means to ransom. It means to liberate or rescue someone from captivity or bondage. And redemption is an act of God by which He Himself pays a ransom for our sins against Him. Imagine that God devises a plan to redeem us, to buy us back, to pay the ransom, and free us from the captivity 
that we are in. That we might be with Him forever. Redemption is the payment price to free one who is in debt or in bondage. Now in the New Testament, when you see that word redeem used, there are two Greek words that are translated redeem or redemption. And the first one is agarezo. And it means to buy something so as to make it yours. And the second one is lutruo. Lutruo. And it means to pay a price to free someone from bondage. You see, in the day of Christ, slavery was a very common and acceptable pro uh, practice. And you could go in the marketplace and you could go bid upon slaves who you can purchase to serve you. And there were slaves that certain wealthy men maybe thought were competent and had done a good job for another friend of his. Maybe they saw the way they worked and they were faithful and good slave and maybe just compassion from time to time would well up in their heart and they would go to a slave auction and they might purchase that slave from their owner with an intent to set them free. They purchased them for one purpose, to set them free. And they would give the owner of that slave a certain price for them, and they would free that slave from the bondage of slavery. And that's the true role. That's what it means to be redeemed. In Him we have redemption, the true role, the purchase which sets the captive free through His blood. So re redemption is the deliverance of payment of the price. Who is captive? Who is captive in view in this passage? It was you. And it was me. Amen. We are captive. You say, well, how so, Pastor? How, how are we captives? We live in the land of the free. <laughs> Look around at our land. Look around at the people in our land. And you'll see so, oh, so much bondage. You see, we are all in bondage to sin. The scripture says that we are slaves to sin. Jesus said, most assuredly, I say to you that whoever would commit sin is a slave of sin. Romans says that men are servants to sin and in bondage to corruption. What is holding us captive is our sin. Because, you see, our sin demands that a price should be paid in order to release the victim. What is the price? Well, the scripture says the wages or recompense of sin is death. And so, in order to purchase sinners from the bondage of sin, there must be death. And the Old Testament says, the soul that sins shall die. And Hebrew says in the New Testament, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sin. There's no forgiveness, there's no pardon, there's no removal of the punishment for crimes committed. And so the just compensation or price for sin is death. And that is the purpose for which God sent His only Son, Jesus Christ, to come to this world. He came as a ransom. He came to redeem us, to free us from the bondage of sin, to pay the just compensation for our sin against the Holy God. 
You see, Jesus came to pay my debt. He came to bring just the pay for the just compensation that I deserve and that you deserve for sinning against God and against others. He paid the price. And the price that he had to pay was death. He paid the price of death to pardon my sins and all who would turn to him. God, the God of justice, was the God of mercy who he himself sent for his own son to be a ransom for you and a ransom for me. How can we understand that love? How can we get our mind around such mercy? That is what Jesus did for you. This redemption is lutro. Jesus paying the debt, the price that was demanded for our sin. And we who were held captive and held ransom were set free. In Him, verse 7 says, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of Sins according to the riches of His glory. The scripture says, Christ has made us free. How many are glad? How many you feel and know that sense of freedom? Praise God. Oh, people think that if they make a commitment to God that they'll lose all opportunity to live freely. But I want to tell you, in living freely apart from God's law, you know what happens? We put ourselves in bondage. Amen. Look at the bondage in our world. Look at, look at all the hurt. Look at all the wayward souls. Look at all the tragedy. Look at how our lives have been broken <coughs> and mangled. How many lives are without hope? How many people are taking their life? We live in a country where more people are on medication for the problems they have in life than aren't. Why? Because the freedom that they have really is nothing short of bondage. And God wanted something better for them as He wanted better for us. And so He made a way that you and I could be free from the bondage of sin that holds men captive. There's five Greek words in the New Testament that have their origin in the legal terminology of the Roman world. And yet, in the Scripture, they very clearly point to Christ. The first word means to acquit. To be acquitted means that you are relieved from a charge or a crime. That you're declared not guilty. And I work in a court system, and I understand this term very well because I've seen that happen many times. When a man went to trial and he was acquitted of that charge that was against him. But in the Bible, that word is translated in the English as justification. Which means being pardoned, pardoned from sin and made acceptable to God. How many of you are glad for justification Amen. from the Amen. The second word means to cancel a debt. It's when a judge hears a case and determines that there's not sufficient, that sufficient retribution had been made and the defendant is not held liable for the debt. He was charged that he owed more of a debt but the judge said, no, that debt is canceled. You know what that word is in the New Testament called? Forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lord. Justification. Forgiveness. 
The third word means to adopt. It means the legal word for adoption of a child. But in this, in the Bible, the word that you read is translated sonship. You see, God calls you to sonship with Him. He calls you to be a son or a daughter to Him. The fourth word means to be reconciled, no longer be opposed to another, but be restored to harmony. And the scripture says that you and I are to be reconciled to God. Lastly, the fifth word means to redeem or purpose for purchase for the purpose of setting free. And the Bible use, translates that word redemption. Mm -hmm. Now that's you. That's me. You see, I want to show you the significance of these words as they relate to Jesus Christ. In justification, the sinner stands before God accused. But in Christ, he is declared righteous. Mm -hmm. In forgiveness, the sinner stands before God as a debtor. But in Christ, he receives the cancellation of that debt. Um. In adoption, the sinner stands before God as a stranger. But in Christ, he is made what? He is made a son or daughter. Right. In reconciliation, the sinner stands as before God as an enemy. But in Christ, He receives. He is made a friend. And in redemption, He stands as a sinner before God. But in Christ, He receives His freedom. Amen. That's what God offers you. That's what He offers me. All of these things Justification and forgiveness and adoption and reconciliation and redemption have been made available to us because Jesus paid the price of our ransom and He liberated us from the bondage of sin. Amen. We are accused, but He bore our punishment mm -hmm. and set us free. We are debtors, but He paid our debt. We are strangers, but He is a son, and in Him we can become sons. We are enemies, but He is a friend, and in Christ we are made a friend of God. And we were slaves, but in Christ we have found our freedom. Mm. Amen. You see, God put forth a plan. We see five glorious aspects of redemption. The first one is the Redeemer. Verse 6 says, To the praise and glory of God's grace by which we are made accepted in the beloved. See, it is only by way of God's grace that we are made accepted. The favor of God given to those who did not earn it and are undeserving. How many of you qualify? Amen. Amen. Really? <laughs> I thought more folks qualified than that. <laughs> you see, that's what God says. We see a Redeemer who by grace has made us accepted in Christ. Notice, it doesn't say that we find acceptance in our religion. It doesn't say that we find acceptance to God by our church or our good works or our efforts to measure up. It says that we find God's favor by the way of grace alone. Mm. Amen. Thank you, Lord. In whom do we have redemption? The scripture says... We are accepted in the Beloved One, Jesus Christ. It is by way of Jesus Christ 
That when we come to a place where we acknowledge our sin and our need of God and our need of a Savior and in turn in repentance with a contrite heart to God, that we can enter into that relationship and enter in to that forgiveness and redemption that Christ offered to you and to me. If you and I rest our faith in God's Redeemer, Jesus Christ, we are accepted because we will be found in the Beloved One. To be found in Christ. Colossians says, We give thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in life. And He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son. Of his love. Isn't that great? Isn't that wonderful? Amen. Amen. You see, God has brought us to the place that we see these glorious aspects of redemption. We see a redeemer, but we also see the redeemed. To the verse 6 says, to the praise and glory of God's grace by which he made us accepted. We see the Redeemer, but we also must see ourselves. The Redeemed. That's you. That's me. That's us. And that's what verse 6 and 7 says. That we, us, are accepted by way of redemption. And I want to tell you, there's nothing like knowing that you don't measure up. That you fall short. And you're undeserving. But there's a God who sent His only Son to die for you and for me that I and you might be redeemed in the sight of God. Isn't that a wonderful Amen. truth? We see the Redeemer. We see the redeemed. We see the redemptive price in whom we have Redemption, verse 7 says, through His blood. What was the price to buy us back and set us free? How was that bondage broken? How was that price paid? The Scripture says, the wages of sin is death. And the price was death. Someone had to die. And Christ was that someone. Jesus shed His blood at Calvary's cross. And He poured out His life. And He paid the price for my sin and for your sin. Jesus in my place. Jesus substituted for me. Substituted for you. The results of God's redemptive plan. Verse 7, that in Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. You know, the Last Supper, Jesus gathered with His disciples. And He said, this is the blood of the New Testament, or covenant, which is shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. You know, in the Old Testament, on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, the Day of National Atonement for Sin, there were two goats, two goats that were brought before the high priest. And they took the first goat and they slit its throat. And they put a bucket underneath. And they took that blood and they poured it on the mercy seat. And it represented the death, the shedding of blood for the sins of the people. And they took the other goat and the priest would lay their hands upon him and he would confess the sins of God's people. And they would take that goat and they would bring it out far away in the wilderness. So it would never be seen again. Because it spoke of God's forgiveness. 
That He takes our sins and He puts it in the sea of His forgetfulness, never to remember it anymore. Amen. And that's what it speaks of. For those who are in Christ, as far as the east is from the west, so far hath He removed our transgressions from us. Lastly, the redemptive inheritance. Verse 10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, that he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and on our earth, in him. For in him we have obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things, according to the counsel of His will. I want to close with just one verse of Scripture. First Peter says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is incorruptible, undefiled, and that does not fade away, but is reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in this last time. And in this, the scripture closes by saying, you can greatly rejoice. Will you bow your head with me? <clears throat> Jesus became my substitute. Jesus in place of me. I should have been the one whose blood was shed and whose life was taken for my sins and you for yours. But before the foundation of the world, God put forth a plan. He looked through time and saw you. He looked down through time and saw your need. And he sent his only son to come to this earth to give himself as a ransom for your sin and for mine. I can't understand such love. I can't understand such mercy. I am hard pressed to think of a reason why God would ever do that for me or for anyone else. But Jesus paid the price for my sin against the Holy God and has brought me into a place and brought you who are in Christ into a place of adoption as sons. That we should be sons of the Almighty God. How could that be? How could that ever happen? How should God ever pay that price? Yet that is the story of love. And the story of love is redemption through Jesus Christ. God shows you in the beginning of the foundations of the world to be in Him. He is actively at work in all the details of your life to bring you to that place. But have you, have you brought yourself to Him? Have you chosen to receive Christ as your Savior? Have you chosen to join in that relationship that He offers you. On a week, 
that we remember the suffering of Christ. There is no greater time or opportunity for you and I to reflect on so great a redemption and so great an inheritance that can be ours. If you're here today, maybe you want to make a decision in your heart to receive Christ. Maybe you're watching us here on local access television. I want to say to you that God loves you and the evidence of His love is Calvary. And if you will come and if you will yield yourself to a place of simple faith, if you will trust God and His promises, if you will entrust your life to God, and He will come and be your Savior and you will know that inheritance. Why don't we stand together? Friend, no words, no words could begin to speak of so great lo of love and sacrifice that Christ has given to you and to me. But what we can do is we can truly lift up our voice and our hands and our hearts and we can give thanks to Him. Let's do that. Have you told the Lord that you loved Him today? Have you, have you remembered the great price? Have you taken that moment to reflect upon His love and the price that He paid for you and for me? Oh, we love you, Lord. We praise you. God, we are, we are without, without words to express how great a joy it is to know you. And I pray that every person that is gathered here, that throughout the course of this weekend, Lord, throughout all of our days, that we never forget how great a price was paid, that we might know you by grace only and find ourselves to be sons, adopted as sons and daughters to the living God with an inheritance that is eternal and waiting in heaven for us. I pray you bless every family, every person that's gathered here, and we give you thanks for your goodness and your love and your redemptive story in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you. And thank you so much.